nice one. All right, yeah, so you get both of us this morning. It's quite exciting, isn't it? So I'm Dave, and he's Ash, just in case you're wondering. We thought we'd dress <laughs> in a similar way, <laughs> yeah, so that, you know. I've got no guitars part. today, but I've got the Bruce Lee Smears mic, so. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if you wanted to grab a guitar, you could, if you felt more comfortable. If I feel a bit more comfortable, I might go and grab one in a bit. I think, no, you'll be all right, you'll be all right. <laughs> Good, so we're going to speak to you today about worship. Quite excited about this. We're both worship leaders, so a lot of what we do with our time is involved in creating musical worship, Um, and so we're going to talk to you a little bit more about that today. So in order to give you an insight into our experience as worship leaders, we thought we would start off by uh, showing you some Star Wars worship memes, okay, just for your entertainment, but mainly because this is how me and Ash communicate and relate to each other. We're both Star Wars fans. You don't need to be a Star Wars fan to appreciate these, um, but I hope you'll enjoy them. So the first one, do you want to get it going? Okay, now Ash, explain to us what is going on in this. So in this particular video, what you'll see is the classic case of using in-ear monitors when you've got touched to a box and you've got the cable and you forget to unplug that when you jump off the stage. This, this happens multiple times. If you ever see you know, someone leaving and they've got like a cable attached to them, <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, the next one, okay, you'll recognize much quicker. Okay, this one is basically Ash every week, all right. Do you ever see him like trying to leave through the auditorium in the foyer and he's got like all his like gear and everything and yeah that's basically everyone just keep talking to him all right if he's carrying lots of stuff. <laughs> the yeah. next one I'm embarrassed to say that this happened a number of times to me. <laughs> <laughs> basically every week isn't it like Ash is talking if to someone If you see me running there. from the back that's what's going yeah, on. Yeah. <laughs> Last week, apparently, the, the, the tablet was about to run out of power, and literally, there was like 30 seconds left on the timer, my wife told me, and so you had to like run out and get like a charger or something, and you ran back in and plugged it in and got your guitar on, it just was as Rob was like landing the prayer, and you said, Amen, and then Ash like strummed his guitar. It was seamless. But, I like, like to live on the edge, what can I you say? Gotta look, you got to look out for these things. All right. And uh, the last one, okay, this is my favorite. Uh, hope you enjoy. There you go, just, you know, we could, the Star Wars We fans. could carry on all day, we, yeah, but yeah. we should probably get on to the Bible reading today. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, fine. Uh, so we're going to read from Luke chapter 19. So if you want to grab a Bible, grab your phone, turn to Luke chapter 19. Like Rob said earlier, this is, we're looking at the time when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And so we're going to read this together, and then we've got some thoughts for you guys. So it's going to come up on the screen behind me as well, but let me read this to us. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you'll find there a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. The colt is a a young donkey. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. And those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked, Why are you untying the colt? And they replied, The Lord needs it. I think it was a Jedi mind trick. The Lord needs it. And then uh, (laughs) they brought it to Jesus and threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near to the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Thanks, Dave. So worship is a conversation. And hopefully you know that a conversation is a two-way thing. There are two elements to a conversation. Um, It's talking, but it's also listening. What? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So we we worship God, and and, and we do that in singing like we did this morning. We we worship, hopefully, through our lifestyles, the way we treat other people. Um, But generally, before we even get to respond in worship, God is already at work revealing himself to us. And this is what we see 
in the passage that we read earlier, but we also see it throughout the whole of the Old Testament. God does something, and then his people build an altar, and they worship him. So God reveals himself, and then his people respond. And so this is the two components of worship we want to talk about today, revelation and response. And this is a helpful way for us to think about our own experiences of worship. God reveals himself to us, and in turn we respond. And then he reveals more of himself, and then we respond more. And then it's like this cycle, this conversation, this journey ebbing and flowing of worship as we're growing in relationship with God, as we're growing in intimacy and coming closer to him. So we're going to look at Revelation first, and it's over to Ash. I'm going to sit down. Enjoy. Just come and rescue me if I need, <laughs> I need any help. <clears throat> so how does, how does Jesus reveal himself in this passage? The context that this is happening, remember Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, he's riding on a donkey, he's coming as a king into the city. But the city of Jerusalem is currently under Roman occupation. So the Romans have moved in, they've taken control, and they pretty much run everything. The Jews were waiting on a Messiah that was prophesied many years before, and that they believed would come and rescue them from Roman rule, probably through victorious battle with a massive army. And in the Bible, in other places, you read, Jesus often talks about the kingdom of heaven. And you'll see the Pharisees get rather upset whenever Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven because the kind of things Jesus was saying seemed to be at odds with their political goals, Mm. which was the liberation of Israel from Roman rule. The Pharisees, they can see that Jesus is stirring things up. He's drawn a bit of attention. There's a lot of miracles. He's got big crowds that gather to to see him. Um, And they warn Jesus that that he he needs to, you know, just be a bit careful because there's a plot by Herod to, to have him assassinated. And they're worried that this attention could be perceived as a threat to the Roman rule, which maybe it was, but not in the way that they thought. Um, In this passage, we also read that Jesus chooses a cult to come into the city. And there are two things about this that make that quite important. Um, The one thing is it's a sign for the Jewish people, because in Zechariah 9, um, there's a passage that says, See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So this is prophesied. The Messiah would come riding on a donkey. So Jesus chose a donkey to... um, to come along into the city at this time. There's another thing that's important about this and significant, and that's the arrival on the back of a donkey meant that you're arriving in peace. So Jesus was arriving in peace instead of as a war-waging king on a stallion followed by Mm. masses of soldiers. Mm. But Jesus is king and lord, and Make no mistake, when he was coming into Jerusalem, he was indicating that he was coming as king. But he chooses to reveal himself as king on his own terms. In John 6, verse 15, we read that after feeding the 5,000, the crowd, having seen all these amazing miracles and just having 5,000 fed with with, um, just a few pieces of food, the crowd thought, we need this guy as our leader. He's going to save us from Roman rule, and they want to crown him forcibly. Jesus becomes aware of this, and he immediately withdraws. He chooses the terms of his kingship. Jesus knew that if the crowd makes you king, your power comes from the crowd. But Jesus' power comes from a clear sense of knowing who he is as the Son of God. His identity comes from the Father. When Jesus was baptized, we we read that the Spirit of God descended down like a dove and rested on him, and a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So Jesus received his sense of identity, and he knows who he is. Jesus had performed many miracles. He'd already got a reputation. Um, There'd been thousands of people seeing uh, the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000. Jesus turned water into wine. Um, There were various healings that we read about as well. The Pharisees realized that Jesus coming in as king into Jerusalem could really rock the boat and attract some unwanted attention from the Roman rulers, cause a bit of an uprising. So they tell Jesus, Keep these guys, you know, get them under control. Get your people under control. Um, You know, we don't want to cause any issues here. But Jesus says, you know what? If these people remain quiet, 
even the rocks will cry out. You know, all of creation recognizes Jesus as Lord. So how does Jesus reveal himself to us today? Well, I think music is a really powerful thing. You know, how many times have you been in an environment and music, music sort of creates a mood, an environment? We put on romantic music when we're having some nice dinner. Um, we can sing a love song and express ourselves. Um, but one of the things that we're trying to do as we lead musical worship in a setting like this, like we, like we did this morning, the band did a great job this morning um, just leading us in worship. What we're trying to do is create an environment that helps us to focus, because music helps us to focus, um, but that we can hear from God and that we can speak to God. And it's kind of almost one of those last safe spaces, isn't it, where we don't have our phones on and we're not checking that every five minutes. And music kind of creates this little bubble, maybe, that, that, that we're able to connect with God. So the other thing that, that's helpful in, in worship is that the songs give us lyrics that help us express something. So maybe within some of the words today, you were finding expressions of your own heart, things that you felt inside, or things that confirmed something for you inside. And those lyrics can help us um, express what we wanted to God. But I'm now going on to Dave's talk, so I should probably get back to what I'm meant to be doing, which is Revelation. The lyrics that we sing as well can reveal something of God's character to us. And I believe that, you know, when people have crafted songs really well and they're theologically sound, they can really help us gain an understanding of God. And so we try and use songs that do that, that help us reflect on who God is and allow Him to speak that into our hearts as well. And you know, I remember when I was back at school, um, I used to close my room door, put on some worship music, and I'd spend hours, because I had a lot more time back then, but I'd spend hours just worshiping. And that was that relationship that Dave mentioned. You know, I was developing a relationship with God where I'd get to know more about who he was. He was revealing himself to me. And then I was able to respond out of that as well. And maybe you found that as we sung a song today, um, you found something resonating in you. And sometimes we sing the same song. Well, we do sing the same songs many times because it's helpful to know the song, right, when, you, when you're trying to sing. Um, but there's something fresh I've found. Every time we worship, I find something new to express myself within that song. Or the Lord reveals something new to me about himself. And I get to know again how much he loves me or how he loves me in a different way. Because as we get to know someone, our relationship develops. We get to know more about them. Um, the way that we relate changes, and so it does with the Lord as well. We've been using words like king and lord to describe Jesus here. Um, and so what I understand from medieval times, because I wasn't around back then, even though I've got some gray hairs appearing, um, soldiers would make a decision to follow a lord or a king. And they... Once they've made that decision, they would follow him into battle, into hardship, even death. Most likely at that time, the, the, the king or the lord would actually be the one leading the charge into battle as well. That's kind of different to many of our political leaders these days, right? Um, but that lord or king would also afford those soldiers his protection. So the, 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 the might that he represented would also be available to all of his soldiers, and they were safe, and he'd look out for them. Today, Jesus is still Lord. He led and won the battle against sin and death. And we'll think about that a bit more as we reflect over this Easter period. Um, but he makes it possible for us to walk in that victory as well. He reveals himself to us in many ways. Sometimes it's through healing. So if you've experienced any healing, that is probably the Lord revealing himself to you. His love for you. His, his desire for you to be whole and well. Sometimes through the kindness of others. That can be the Lord speaking. Revealing his heart for you. Sometimes we can actually sense his presence, and, and, and hopefully you'll have an opportunity to experience that as we worship together here. Sometimes we can even hear him speak. Now, over time, for better or for worse, I've revealed who I am to my children. Um, I've fed them, I've comforted them, I've been, them, been with them when they were sick, I've played with them. So they know who I am because of who I've revealed myself to be. And sometimes I need to say some difficult things to them, or I need to shout at them to stop something because they might be in danger. And hopefully, they respond because they know who I am and they know that I have their, their, their best 
in, uh, I have the best intentions towards them, and I'm, and I'm looking out for them. So when we recognize Jesus as our Lord, we have a choice on whether to follow him or not. If we choose to follow him, we submit our rights and our freedoms. Our, commit to, our commitment to him requires obedience. That obedience is for our own good. Jesus doesn't seek to oppress us by ruling over us, and this is the good thing. So we can trust in his rulership over us. But he reigns over us with justice, so he's fair, but he's also merciful. He'll discipline us because he loves us, but he's also got our back. Well, you've probably found this, but we will be ruled over one way or another. And, you know, that could be by our sinful nature, our own desires. It could be by other people, our national rulers even. Or we could be ruled by Jesus. Jesus offers us the freedom from enslavement to sin. And he offers us the hope of a new life in him. So we have a choice. So when faced with Jesus revealed as king, seeking to rule in your heart, how will you respond? Dave, come and tell us about this. Nice. All right. Good. So Jesus reveals himself to us as king. And so how do we respond? How, what do we do about that? Well, worship should flow out of this, out of our understanding of who Jesus is. And you've heard a bit from Ash about who God is, what he's like, his character. And each of us will have an experience of who God is and a background of that. And I'm hoping that God is revealing more of himself to us as we go. So being with God, I think, wants to make us be with him more. And worship is actually about spending time with God, not just about singing songs. Okay. Um, so worship is, like an, is the natural response to God revealing who he is. And as we get to know God, we see his impact on our lives. It can flow out of us. So what, what does this look like? Well, we, let's have a look in the passage earlier. It's the disciples laid their cloaks out for Jesus. The disciples began to joyfully praise God in loud voices for all the miracles he'd done. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. They laid their cloaks on, on the donkey and, and on the floor. So they, there was a self-sacrifice there. They, they were giving of themselves. They wanted to, to give in worship to Jesus. So what should our response look like? Well, from what I can see in the passage, the disciples are not holding anything back. It's public. You know, they're singing out loud with loud voices. They were joyful. You could probably see it on their faces as well. They were willing to sacrifice their own comfort to bring Jesus honor and worship. Well, what does that, what does that look like for me? Well, growing up, I always thought singing in church was just part of what we did together. You know, we learned songs to help us learn about God, which is true. Um, but I didn't really understand the greater context. I would sing, but I was very reserved in my body, you know, or even in my mind. Like, I would only ever sing the words that were in front of me that were, like, dictated to me by the screen or by, like, the hymn book. And I wasn't open to the idea that there was something else might be going on, that worship is so much bigger. I actually... I realized that it was more than just singing songs. I realized I got a little bit older. I went to Bible college, and it was just the place where God started to meet me. And I learned that worship is a conversation and that um, God speaks to us while we worship, that he manifests his presence with us, that healing can happen in the room simply because God is here, and that if we give ourselves to him, that we can be transformed in his presence more and more into the likeness of Jesus. I decided to take a step out, and we were singing a song, and the word dance came up, okay, one of those scary moments in, in a worship set, <laughs> if, you, if you're like me, okay, because being a man of my, uh, you know, status, I, I'm, I'm not very good at dancing, okay, but I decided that I wanted to give it a try, I wanted to be all in for God, so I decided to bust a move right there and worship, I don't know what it looked like, but, you know, uh, in that moment, in a room full of people, I decided to give it a try, and it was weird, like, God, God met me in that place, in, in this, this sacrifice of praise. And it was a sacrifice because I, there was no way I could have looked good, okay? But God honored that, and he met me. And, and there was this sudden burst of electricity that I felt through my body, and it was the Holy Spirit. And he just, I don't know, he met me in this moment of intimacy, and I was hooked. And I decided, now I, I want to be the most extravagant of worshipers for God because of what he's done in my life, but also because of the intimacy that he offers us, that actually he wants to have this close friendship with us. He wants to meet with us in worship. And, and I want to experience that power, of, that transformational power every time I worship him. So, 
you don't have to raise your hands when you worship, but why not give it a try? Like the posture of our bodies tells ourselves so much about how we can respond. You know, actually, if we put ourselves in the right position, we can tell our souls to sing. We can tell our souls to respond to God. And if we hold ourselves back, there's no way that we're ever going to respond more than what we're, you know, allowing our bodies to do. And, you know, if you have to kind of flex your armpit and check your uh, smell, that, <laughs> it's okay, all right? People will be forgiving, honestly. But the Bible calls us to raise our hands in worship. It says, lift your hands up to the sanctuary in Psalm 134. And in Psalm 141, may my prayer be set like incense before you, my uplifted hands like the evening offering. So it's part of us giving our all to Jesus. And if a song says dance, then feel free to dance. You might be better than, uh, than, than me. And uh, actually sing loud. Let's, let's give our all. Don't worry about the person next to you. That's why we turn the music up in this church, because it means you can lose yourself in the crowd. And you can, just, just like a football match, you lift up your voice, shout loud, and just see how God responds to us and worship. And we're going to do that in a little bit. So what? So what now? What? Ash, come and, come and talk to us as we land this thing. We just wanted to give us all an opportunity just to say yes to Jesus. If you've not done this before um, and you'd like to today, maybe you've experienced something during our musical time of worship. Maybe, you've, um, maybe something jumped out for you from the talk today. Maybe you feel your pulse racing and your heart quickening. As we start talking about saying yes to Jesus, maybe that could be Jesus revealing himself to you right now and asking for a response. Maybe you don't feel anything in particular, but you would like to respond to Jesus today. You can do that now. So would you like to just close your eyes? And if this is the first time, or you'd like to just recommit your life to Jesus, just agree with the words that I pray now, and you can use them as your own. Jesus, thank you for revealing yourself to me. I know that I don't always get things right, but I'm beginning to understand that you love me and that you paid the ultimate price to save me from sin and death. I choose today to recognize you as my Lord and Savior, and I invite you to rule in my heart. Amen. And if you've just prayed that, just get, everyone just keep your eyes closed for a moment. And If you've prayed that for the first time or as a recommitment, just make eye contact with me as I look around the room now. And then... At the end of the service, come and chat to Dave or I or anyone that you've maybe come in with or somebody that looks like they know Jesus. We'd love to chat and pray with you.